back to this lecture series for Introduction to Philosophy. This video will conclude our discussion of the problem of evil. Now you recall that in our previous video we looked at two theodicy responses to the problem of evil. And remember that a theodicy aims to give some plausible reasons that could justify God in permitting evil. We looked at the idea that God permits evil because God has to permit evil in order for human beings to have free will. We also looked at the idea that God is said to permit evil as a means of allowing for soul building. The idea that we cannot develop as human beings, as persons, if we don't face challenges uh, for which we have to use our moral capacities. And so both of those resp responses were theodicies that really intend to go into detail about why God might see it necessary to allow for evil and horrible tragedy and suffering to occur. In this video, we're going to look at the other sort of response, which we've been calling the defense response. And the defense response, you'll remember, is a weaker form of response where the person giving a defense is not going to say, here are the reasons why God allows evil to occur, or the reasons God could have for allowing evil to, to occur. The person giving the defense response is just going to say, look, I don't know why God allows evil, but we human beings are not in a position to know in the first place, so we shouldn't expect to know. And so the fact that we can't see any good reason why God might have for allowing evil shouldn't make us doubt or question God's existence. In order to understand the skeptical theist position, we need to take a step back and remember that Rowe's inference is a no seem inference. That is, it's a sort of inference where you say, well, something must not exist because I can't see it or detect it or, not in, or um, I can't find it in any way. And what we need to think about is, we've said that sometimes no seem inferences are good and sometimes they're bad. Sometimes they're valid, sometimes they're invalid. So when is a no seem inference good and when is it bad? And I think to get at this, we should look at the following two examples that Daniel Speet gives of a bad no -seum inference. And by doing this, we can then ask, okay, well, why are these bad inferences? And then we can ask, does Rowe's inference share these characteristics? Is, and then, is Rowe's inference also a bad no -seum inference? Okay, so let's look at the first example. Consider the beginner at chess who cannot see what good could come from Kasparov's decision to surrender his queen. Should we conclude from the fact that the beginner can't see the long-term and complex result of a master's move that there probably is no such good? No. So what's going on here? Well, who is he referring to? Kasparov? Uh, Gary Kasparov is the greatest uh, living chess player, maybe the greatest chess player of all time. So what Speak is imagining is that let's see you have a total chess novice, someone who knows how to play the game at a basic level, right? knows how the pieces are meant to move, but really knows nothing about strategy or very little about strategy. Suppose they're watching Kasparov, the greatest chess player ever, um, make a move which Kasparov knows will allow his, his queen to be captured. Now, the beginner or the novice might look at that uh, move and say, well, that seems like a strange idea. I mean, the queen's a very powerful, uh, very potent piece in the game. Why would Kasparov do that? And, you know, that novice, that beginner might say to themselves, well, look, I can't see any reason why Kasparov would do this, so there must be no good reason for it. Now, of course, in that case, we would say that's a very hasty inference. We wouldn't think that is a good argument or inference at all. And largely, of course, that's because we wouldn't expect a mere beginner to understand the, understand the strategy of a chess master. Let's consider another bad noceum inference. Consider someone who draws the conclusion that there's no intelligent life outside our solar system on the basis of her careful perusal of the night sky over many years. Having seen no aliens, she concludes there are none. Would we accept this as a reasonable form of inference under these conditions? Clearly not. Okay, so what's the point here? Well, here's another no -seum inference. I don't see any aliens up in the sky, therefore there mu must not be any aliens. Now, maybe there are aliens, maybe there aren't. But the point is, this is, would not be a good reason to think there aren't any aliens. Because, of course... You, a human being with your limited perspective standing on the planet Earth, you can't see the entire universe. You can't see the vast stretches 
of the universe that are, and even the tiny sliver we get to see, we can't see in enough rev resolution with our naked eye to see whether there's an alien on Mars or something. So this would be another bad no seem inference. We wouldn't think that the mere fact that this person can't see any alien life forms mean there are none. Now the important question here is, we would agree these are bad no seem inferences, but why are they bad? And I think each of these examples brings out a specific aspect or characteristic of bad no seem inferences. So let's consider the first case, where this chess novice can't see the reason why Kasparov would surrender his queen and says, well, there must be no good reason. What is it that makes this a bad um, no seem inference? Well, it's a fact about the observer, right? In this case, it's a lack of knowledge or cognitive ability on behalf of the observer or the knower. In comparison to Kasparov, the chess novice doesn't know very much about chess, doesn't know very much about chess strategy. So if Kasparov has some sort of elaborate plan for which involves him surrendering, surrendering his queen, then the chess novice wouldn't, shouldn't expect that he'd be able to see it because he simply doesn't have sufficient knowledge and understanding of chess. Therefore, when the chess no novice doesn't see it, the novice shouldn't conclude that, oh, there must not be any good reason. So one thing that makes a bad no seem inference bad is if the person making it simply doesn't have enough background knowledge, enough cognitive ability to understand the thing they're trying to find. And then think about the second instance of a bad no seem inference. So there's a person standing on Earth who can't see any aliens. What is it about this person that also doesn't leave them in a position to draw this conclusion? Well, they have a very limited perspective. They have a very limited standpoint, right? It's because we can only see this small, tiny portion of the universe uh, that, in fact, we shouldn't expect that if there are aliens out there, we would be able to see them with the naked eye or even our best technology. So this is another aspect. When you have someone with a very limited standpoint, a limited perspective, or if they have relatively little knowledge or cognitive ability, then you might say that this person cannot draw these sorts of no seem inferences because they just aren't in a position where they should expect to be able to see the thing they're trying to find. And this gives us a general principle for um, evaluating no CM inferences, which I will call the principle of reasonable seeability. And one way this is outlined is by Stephen Weikstra, who writes, we can argue from we see no X to there is no X only when X has reasonable seeability. That is, it is the sort of thing which, if it exists, we can reasonably expect to see uh, it in the situation. And so, the idea is that you can only draw no seem inference. You can only say, well, I don't see this thing, therefore it's not there. If you have a good, um, reasonable opportunity or a reasonable expectation that you should be seeing or that you should be detecting or you should be in the presence of that thing. And as we've seen, reasonable seeability requires a couple of things. It re requires sometimes that you have the proper knowledge and mental capacity to see the thing in question. And, of course, it requires that you have the appropriately large and wide standpoint or perspective to think, see the thing in question. This is what was wrong with the two bad no -seam inferences that we saw before. But if we think back to one of the examples of a very good no -seam inference, for instance, I don't see my book on the table in front of me, therefore that book must not be there. Well, notice it's a good no seem inference because if there's a book on my table, I should be, I, I have a reasonable chance of seeing that the book is there. If there really is a book on my table, then I should expect that I would be able to see it. It doesn't take any special knowledge or cognitive ability. It just requires that my eyes are functioning properly. I have the appropriate and adequate standpoint. I can see the entire table. So in that case, a no seem inference would be perfectly justified for all the reasons that the other two inferences weren't justified. Now you might be wondering, well, what does this have to do with our present uh, dilemma about the problem of evil? Well, remember what we're trying to see here. We're, tr we're wondering, should we expect to be able to see the reasons God would have 
for permitting evil to occur. And what the skeptical theist is going to say, well, based on what we know about human beings, based on our limited perspective, and based on our lack of knowledge in comparison to God, we should not be able to expect that we would see the reasons God for has for allowing evil. And in fact, the analogy with um, the chess master and the chess novice is very apt here. Because the idea would be that God is like the chess master. God has complete knowledge. God has knowledge of the entire universe. And when something very bad happens in our tiny corner of the universe, it's easy for us to think that we can't see any good reason um, why God would allow, have for allowing that to happen. But the idea is, if we really had God's knowledge, if we had a perspective of how the whole universe should work over all space and all time, then we might be able to see the overall plan that God has. But given our very limited perspective, given our um, extreme lack of cognitive ability and knowledge in comparison to God, the idea is that we should not expect that whatever reasons God has for permitting evil, we shouldn't expect we would be able to see them in the first place. So when we can't come up with any reasons for why a fawn has to suffer horribly before it dies after a forest fire, we shouldn't think that is strong evidence that God doesn't exist. Because we wouldn't expect we could see those reasons in the first place. Now to bring this point home, uh, skeptical theists often use the following kind of example, which we'll call the parent analogy. So, so Speak explains this analogy. Consider the parent who must submit her four-year-old four child to a painful procedure for the child's medical well-being. We do not expect the child to be able to understand the complex goods and evils of long life, of cancer and chemotherapy, etc., reflection on which animate the parent. If there are goods that justify the parent in permitting the horror of, say, chemotherapy, and at least in some cases there surely are, it is true that a four-year-old would prob is it true that a four-year-old would probably know about them quite cl quite clearly no. All the skeptical theist appears to need, in addition to this image, then is the very compelling thought that our human situation before God would be sufficiently like the child's epistemic situation before her parent. So another now analogy which makes this point. If you have a young child who, un unfortunately, for instance, had cancer and had to go undergo the painful and horrible experience of chemotherapy, then the parent might be able to try to explain this to the child, but they may never truly be able to understand. If the child was young enough, they might actually hold resentment toward the parent, think the parent was treating them incorrectly, and of course the parent wouldn't be, but it would just because that the child would not be in a position to understand. So if the child were to conclude that the parent doesn't care about them, that the parent isn't doing what's best for them, then in fact they would have concluded incorrectly. And of course the point that the skeptical theist is trying to make here is that our relationship, the human relationship toward God, is like this parent-child relationship. The idea is that for all we know, there may be reasons that God knows about for permitting evil and bad things to happen to us that we simply cannot understand. And so just as the child shouldn't expect to understand all the reasons a parent has for doing what the parent does, neither should we expect to understand all the reasons that God has for allowing certain things to happen, for allowing evil to happen. So now that we have some understanding of the skeptical theist position, and how the skeptical theist uses the parent analogy, we should think of some um, criticisms of it or ways of evaluating it. And here I want to look at two different criticisms, both made by Rowe in subsequent articles that, that were uh, written later on in response to the skeptical theist. So the first, to get at the first criticism he makes, you should consider the following question. In this parent analogy, how old should the child be? Right? In Speet's original example that we just looked at, he talks about a four-year-old child. In this passage here um, that I have from Roe, he is responding to Stephen Weikstra, who makes the parent analogy with a one-month-old infant. And this is actually a rather big difference, because suppose in the parent analogy we're supposed to be imagining a child who is only a month old and the parent has to subject that one month old 
to a painful medical treatment for its own good. Now, if that is the case, if we're imagining a one-month-old infant, then we might say, well, that's not really a good analogy to human beings and God. And the main reason for that is, as Roe goes on to explain here, is that it's not just that a one-month-old infant can't understand morality and reasoning in the way an adult can, but a one-month-old infant can't understand reasoning and morality at all. And look, no one would claim, you know, if God does exist, then certainly human beings are in a much diminished state in terms of knowledge, in terms of our moral abilities, etc. But we still are able to understand morality and understand judgments about good and bad. We can even understand um, forms of enjoyment and certain goods that we've never experienced. For instance, in many religious traditions, there's this idea that the highest happiness we can experience is being in the eternal presence and having union with God. Now, no human being has ever, you know, currently living on earth has, currently, has ever experienced that, but skeptic, many skeptical theists would hold that this is in fact a good that we can have some notion of. But if we can have a notion of goods that we've never even experienced, then we actually have pretty complex ability to understand moral right and wrong. So it wouldn't really be appropriate to compare us to a one-month-old infant. On the other hand, let's say you compare human beings to a four-year-old child. Now this might be a little more accurate because as you compare human beings to God, four-year-old children, they have some understanding of morality and some understanding of consequences and reasoning, although not to the extent of an adult. On the other hand, though, even if a four-year-old child can't fully understand why they have to undergo chemotherapy, why they have to undergo um, a number of other things they may not enjoy but might be for their own good, even if they can't fully understand it, they can grasp it to some extent. You can explain to a four-year-old child um, that this may not be fun now, but we'll need to do it um, so you can have more fun later. There are ways you can explain things to children um, even if you're not doing it in a complex way, that will let them get some grasp of what you're talking about. So there seems to be a, a bit of a dilemma here. If you make the child and the parent analogy too young, then they're not really like human beings. If you make them old enough, then they seem to be able to understand morality and to have some grasp of the reasons the parent has for doing what the parent is doing. And so Rose's main point here is that it's really not appropriate to say that we shouldn't have, that even though God would be vastly more intelligent and knowledgeable than we are, it's not appropriate to say that we couldn't have any inkling of what God's reasons for allowing evil are. That, in any case, is the first criticism. He just says we actually do have some reasonable expectation of seeing God's reasons, so we should see some inkling of them when we think about cases like, for instance, the fawn suffering for days in the forest before dying. Let's also look at his second criticism, however. So let's say we accept this idea that human beings, we simply, we can't, we could never understand or we could never see the reasons God would have for allowing evil. Suppose we accept that to be the case. Roe makes another very important point here, that if we push the parent analogy, um, does seem like it could be a real problem for the skeptical theists. So here's what Roe says. What happens when a loving parent intentionally permits her child to suffer intensely for the sake of a distant good that cannot be otherwise uh, realized? In such instances, the parent attends directly to the child throughout its period of suffering, comforts the child to the best of her ability, expresses her concern and love for the child in ways that are unmistakably clear to the child, assures the child that the suffering will end, and tries to explain as best she can why it is necessary for her to permit the suffering even though it is in her power to prevent it. So what's the point he's making here? Go back to the parent analogy. You have a child who's undergoing chemotherapy and is suffering greatly, and let's say the child cannot understand why this has to happen. The parent is attempted to explain, but the child simply can't comprehend. Okay, that's fine. But notice what else the parent would do. The parent would be right at the child's bedside. The parent would make 
his or her presence unmistakably known and clear to the child. They would show concern, care, and sympathy, and be a, a good parent would be there for the child throughout the entire ordeal. There would never be a single moment where the child thought that not only do I not understand why I'm suffering this, but I also have to suffer it alone. And so then the question is, well, if that's what we would expect in the parent analogy, then shouldn't we also expect that same thing between God and humans? And then you have to ask yourself the question, for every single individual who is suffering greatly, who for every human being who um, experiences real tragedy in their lives, is the presence of God always unmistakably clear? Now, maybe for some people, they think the presence of God is unmistakably clear to them. Maybe for certain individuals, the presence of God gives them strength to get through their difficult time, and they feel the sympathy, care, and concern of God. But, of course, that can't possibly be the case for all people who suffer. Many people are atheists. Many people don't believe in God. Many people are part of religions that don't believe in God in the traditional monotheistic sense. There could be people who believe in God but feel betrayed by God in their instances of suffering when they um, have to undergo tragedy and feel that God has abandoned them. And if all that's true, if there are people who suffer greatly but in fact do not feel the presence of God, then we might wonder whether the parent analogy doesn't sort of work in the opposite way. If if in fact God is supposed to be to human beings like a parent is to a child, then why isn't it the case that for every single person that suffers, there can never be any doubt in their mind that there is a loving, divine being who is doing its best to explain to them why they must suffer and giving them the comfort they need um, while that suffering is occurring. This is at least the criticism that Roe makes. Now, there's certainly much more to say about this analogy. I think it really gets to the heart of the matter. So I'll be interested to hear what you think about whether you think the parent analogy is an accurate way to describe the relationship between God and human beings. However, for the moment, I will cut this video here. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.